awesome. So, and I left my coffee way over there, which is a sin. So good morning, everybody. I'm Kevin. Thank you very much. I'm not really excited about being Kevin. I've been Kevin for 45 years. I've been Kevin Johnson for 18 less than that. So we're going to be talking about what could it hurt. And this is a talk. Uh, it's actually the first time I've given this talk. Uh, it's a topic that over the last year, two years, I've been seeing a move to where as we do penetration testing, which we'll talk about in a second, we're finding more and more low-hanging fruit in applications that shouldn't have those vulnerabilities. And when we talk to the developers, because we try to, right? Um, <clears throat> I, I'm a very firm believer as a security person, my job is not to just come in and say, ha, 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 I hacked you, you suck, go home, right? Even though I will admit we say that every once in a while. Okay, a lot. My job is to actually help make things better. Nobody woke up in the morning and said, you know what, I want to hire somebody to hack me because I want to be hacked, right? And if they did, they're psychotic. We're here to help. And so we try to talk to the developers, we try to talk to the teams, and what we're finding is, we're finding lots and lots of low-hanging fruit that when we talk to the developer, when we talk to the architect, when we talk to the people that are responsible for this, the answer we get is, oh man, I, I thought the framework would fix that. I thought, I thought we were protected by the platform we used. Right? Heck, OWASP just released the top 10 for 2017, right? And when you look at the top 10 vulnerabilities of 2017, cross-site request forgery is no longer on the list. And so I reached out to OWASP and said, hey, um, why? Right? I, I find cross-site request forgery in almost every app I test. And their answer was, the frameworks fix it. So it's been fixed. OWASP, this is an organization that's the entire purpose is to provide facts. And they just talked out of their rear, right? Like, I, like no, the framework's fixing it doesn't fix the problem. And, and what we find is more and more, when we talk to these developers, especially newer developers, right, they're not even familiar with what the security controls should be. Because, again, the frameworks will protect them. And so what I want to talk about today is some of the examples from my testing, from talking to other testers, from talking to developers, of places where we continue to fail with that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And that is the purpose of me keynoting today. So about me, a little bit. Like I said already, I'm Kevin. Not that exciting, right? I am a security consultant. Uh, in case you weren't aware of this, what I do day in and day out when I'm not on stage speaking is I hack people. Um, it's a fun job, right? I, I, I get to be the person that says, well, last night when I was breaking into that bank and not worry about going to jail, which is kind of cool, right? Um, it, it's an odd job, right? It's why we have the slogan professionally evil because we want to think evilly, but be professional about it, not go to jail. It's a good plan. There's a lot about me. I, I'm a speaker, I'm a course author. As a matter of fact, uh, two days ago, we released 100% free open source, a six day course on web pen testing. So if you want to learn the basics of web pen testing, one, this is not a sales pitch. This is 100% free. We are actually moving it over to GitHub uh, so that people can contribute. We can actually, our idea is we want to build a body of knowledge that is accessible to everybody, right? Because I'm a very firm believer. I'm a horrible business owner. My goal as a business owner is to put ourselves out of business. If we do our job right, you don't need us, right? Now, Wells Fargo, the people who hold my mortgage aren't afraid of that happening anytime soon, but our job is to educate, and that's why we give free training to vets and first responders and active duty military, and then this course is available to everybody for free. And it is literally a six-day course, including the capture the flag. Uh, the exercises have not been released yet because we're cleaning them up, uh, but we're working on that right now. So other than that, i a uh, podcaster, uh, open source project lead. If you've ever played with bass, I apologize. Um, 
So when you talk about intrusion detection later, uh, if they give you an example of base, just throw stuff because the project hasn't been maintained in forever. <laughs> so, uh, and it's an awful, awful project. Uh, and then I'm a nerd. Uh, the last thing I'm going to uh, mention, uh, it's the thing my wife says is the nerdiest thing I've ever done. Uh, all the pictures in costume are me. Um, I'm a member of the 501st. The 500, yeah, okay, so you know the 501st, right? We're a bunch of nerds that dress up as plastic spacemen. And we build our costumes, uh, screen accurate Star Wars costumes, and then we wear them for charity. In 2016, we raised $11 million worldwide. We haven't gotten the numbers yet for 2017, which is why I'm using old numbers. Uh, the, my favorite picture up there, uh, other than the ones with my children, is this one right here with the Darth Vader. That's me in my ESP Vader. Uh, there were two to 300 blind kids that they brought together. They had them watch the Star Wars movies, and then they had us hang out with them for three hours so that they could feel what the characters felt like, right? It was awesome, like tears streaming the whole time. It was just a blast. My latest costume is Gamorrean Guard, and it is so fun to wear because it scares the crud out of people. But having said that, it's what we do. Like it's, and if you're ever in Jacksonville, stop by the office. All the costumes are on mannequins. Uh, we literally have people stop by to take a tour of the office. It's sad, right? We had this little kid. He came in with his dad, saw the costumes and everything else like that. He was in the office building. We saw him. He, was, he saw the stormtrooper through the window. And I, I, I saw him. I said, yeah, come on in. And him and his dad came in. They saw the costumes. He was all he was shaking. He was so excited, right? And uh, I said, oh, well, you know, anytime you're back, if your dad's okay with it, come back up. We get new costumes all the time. We get new stuff, uh, everything else. Two months later, there's a knock on the door, and there's a woman with this kid. I'm assuming it's his mom, just like I assume the other guy was his dad. And she said, I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm sure my son made this up, but he said he can come up here anytime he wants and see there's toys. <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, we told him he could come up anytime, of course. And she got this look and said, oh my gosh, she wasn't making this up. She goes, he's been saying that like weekly for the two months and I thought he was lying. <laughs> And he's, when he started crying today, I thought I should bring him up. Well, the minute she said, when he started crying, he went, I, I didn't cry. I wasn't crying. <laughs> it's like, okay, kid, no problem. <laughs> so that's our office. So uh, security, I, I actually laugh when we talk about security. Nothing against this conference. I, I like the idea of this conference. But I find that one of the biggest problems we have with security is we treat it as something separate, right? There's a security day at the company to work on security. There's security bugs we need to fix, right? And this is one of the key problems because the minute you treat security as something separate, then all of a sudden it becomes something you have to budget for separately. When the reality is a security bug is a bug, right? If, if you have a security hole in your application, you have a hole in your application. If I put a single quote in a form field and I get an error message back, that's SQL injection, probably. But it's also broken, right? We should stop talking about it as something separate. Of course, I'm biased, right? Uh, it is my job. But as we start paying attention to things, and I, and I don't think it's new to pay attention, but I do think it's new to pay attention at the level people are. The fact that I'm not getting calls from CEOs and CFOs and boards of directors that are starting to pay attention to security. Right? Now, sadly, it's because it's in the news. Right? They're not worried about security because they're worried about data. They're worried about security because they don't want to be on CNN. Right? Equifax caused that. Right? Target caused that. So let's not talk about the fact that they named themselves after something people shoot at. And then we're surprised when somebody tried to hack them. I, I just don't understand that. But security is critical. And as I said at the very beginning, what we're seeing is that there's a move away from securing things. Because there's this assumption security is handled for you. And, and I see this. I, we, I've been pen testing for over a decade now. Um, I'm old and a nerd. And I am literally finding flaws in 2018 
that we've found and talked about and figured out solutions for in 1998. Right? I literally am finding file include flaws. The ability to read arbitrary files from the file system. That is not a flaw your app should have. Period. I am finding cross-site scripting, and I'm sure, I, I believe that I don't need to teach anybody in this room what cross-site scripting is, right? But I am finding cross-site scripting in search fields on web pages. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now that if your search function on every one of your pages is vulnerable to cross-site scripting, just go home, right? That's a fail. That's not something you should be hiring me to find. That should be handled for you. You should be doing that already. That is such an obvious place. We'll use the example of the Slido one that you guys just did, right? If putting script alert, I can has XSS, would have worked there, we should go to the building where the Slido developers are and burn it down. <laughs> because that's, that's just asinine. That shouldn't work. Now, you want to talk about doing base URLs, you want to talk about doing C data tags, to inject past the web app firewall, then we can start talking about, that's yeah, not a bad idea. Then we can start talking about, that's a failure because you didn't take it far enough. Not, you didn't take it anywhere. If that alert had worked, I would have been embarrassed for the developers. And I bet you when we talked to them, they would have said, oh, but Django handles that for us, or Ruby on Rails. I know, I know, I said Ruby, I apologize. Right? This is the problem we're running into. And we're seeing it over and over and over again. So, this is just a sample, which is really sad, right? The breaches in 2017. The fact that we can collect logos like this and put them up. And by the way, we really should say public breaches. The breaches we've been told about. Because I can't tell you the number of times I get called by a customer we got hacked. Really? That's funny. I never heard about that. There's breach notification laws, right? Oh, no, it's okay. We don't have to notify. Why not? Our lawyers said we don't. <laughs> Your lawyers are more not. <laughs> Sorry. This is what we're seeing. And <clears throat> so can I share some approaches and stories to helping companies with their public relations when you help them find issues that have become public? I'm assuming, whoever asked that, uh, that you're talking about it becomes public outside of them announcing it, right? Like somebody finds a paste bin with all of their data or some attacker says, ha ha ha, I have season 27 of Games of Thrones. That was, I did not say that correctly. Games of Thrones, what is, it's a different show. It's on BHO, but, <laughs> It's good that speaking isn't part of my job. My answer to that is, don't let it go public before you know about it. Seriously. Because, not to be rude, there are no ways you can recover from that politely and well. Like the whole PR thing, yeah, you can do PR. Do me a favor, when you send out that notification, do not say in the notification, we take your security very seriously, because you don't. If you did, you wouldn't be writing that letter. But the reality is, in my mind, in my opinion, of course, I'm full of opinions, I'm full of lots of things, my eyes are brown, go with it. But, is that the minute it gets released outside of you, you have no control over what gets talked about. And that's a problem. And so what I say about find it out before it goes public is not don't get hacked. Right? I am not so stupid to believe that we can secure our systems to a point they're unhackable. I'm not Oracle. 21 days. That's all it took. So what I say is monitor for that type of data. Be the person who finds it before somebody else does and then react to it well. Right? Have a plan in advance to what you're gonna do. You nodded when I said who wrote it, so I'm assuming it was, okay, good. Then I, I just, I realize I'm like staring down the one guy, and I, I, you know, there's a reason. But, um, right, so be prepared in advance. Know who's gonna talk to the media, have a plan to talk to the media. I love when companies say to me, oh, we're not gonna talk to the media, really? So you have an electric fence, right? 
They will show up. They will knock on your door. I worked at a company, and I want to be very clear, when I worked at the company, I wasn't responsible for security. Not that it would have helped. Uh, the FBI came in and arrested one of our employees during the day. Uh, he had been doing innocent images and sending them back and forth, and he should be shot, but that's a different conversation. And they arrested him, and they were walking him out, and there was another group of FBI agents coming in. They met in the parking lot. Hey, I didn't know you were here. You were coming out, we should have car carpool. Uh, they were there to arrest a different employee who was stealing data from the company and selling it. The way the company found out was intrusion detection by FBI. That's when you don't have an IDS system. It's when the FBI tells you you were hacked. That's a suck way to find out, right? They scrambled at a point, and that's when they learned that idea that they can't control whether they're in the news. They can't control whether they're in. So prepare for it. Does that help? Does that somewhat answer it? Um, so these are all the breaches. These are all fun. My, my favorite one up here is the Equifax one. And the, and the reason it's my favorite one is, let's, let's be blunt. Equifax is a company we all love to hate, right? So what do they do? They take our data, collect it, and then sell it back to us. You want to know what you ha we have about you? 20 bucks, <laughs> right? So them getting hacked is just like vengeance. Like, yeah, screw you in my credit. <laughs> but then when they came out, they're like, because we all know what the vulnerability was, right? Struts. The framework they developed their application. I know it's Java, right? So all you Python guys can go, ha ha, not us. We'll talk about Django later. But they had a stress problem. And they came out and they like talking to the Senate, right? It's like, hey, what happened? Well, there was this one guy, Fred. I made up the Fred part. <laughs> I don't know his name. Right? Fred was supposed to apply that patch, and damn it, he didn't. His fault, not ours. Bullshit, excuse me. <laughs> No, it wasn't. There was no one guy named Fred responsible for that patch. Because if any of you have ever done struts development, if any of you have ever worked in a Java environment, you know that if you had applied the update for struts, you would have had to rewrite major parts of your application. <laughs> right? Because the struts developers, I swear that what they do is they snort some coke and then they rewrite the entire API and release it as a minor update. It should be fine. It won't break anything. Well, everything. I know I just said this stress developers start coke. That was probably bad. But I meant soda. Up a straw. Totally. But right, like this is the problem. Okay? And we know, I want to be clear. I, we can stand up here and say, wow, stupid developers. You hear that all the time, don't you? What happened is a stupid developer made a mistake. The reality though, when I talk to people. And I want to be clear, I am a stupid developer. Like I said, if you never looked at base, oh, I'm so sorry. The reality is most developers aren't stupid. I won't say all, because you all know that one guy, right? <laughs> that guy's an idiot. <laughs> most developers want to pay attention to security. Most developers we talk to know security things, right? But we have this, if you, I know you've all heard it, right? Three options, fast, correct, cheap, pick two. My experience is really pick one, right? I mean, it is, right? Like, it can be fast. Well, then it's not going to be cheap, and it's not going to work. You're going to spend a lot of money, and it's going to fail. Healthcare.com. But, guys, that's just a reference, right? And we've made this even worse, right? Because we've made this idea that security is easy. Development is easy. And I pick on Microsoft and Pluralsight right now, and I want to be very clear. I like Microsoft and Pluralsight. I'm a member of Pluralsight. They have awesome training classes. But one of the problems with what we've done is we have advertised things that, you know, it's like learn Python development in 21 seconds books. Right? The fact that, and I want to be very clear, this is not a political comment, but the fact that President Obama stood up one day and learned to code. And it was in all the news. President Obama is a coder now, he's a developer now, because it's that easy. You can sit down for two hours, run through a web page, and you're now a developer. 
We're hiring people like that. That's an issue. Because again, nothing against President Obama, but he's not a developer. He's not even a programmer. He's a dude that went through a tutorial and followed the steps. And my understanding is he screwed up two of them when he started. <laughs> right? That's the issue. And we're promoting this as this, oh, everybody can be a developer. Everybody can't be a developer. My wife is the perfect example of this. And I want to be very clear. Denise knows I use her as the example. Because the first words she ever said to me when she met me was, I hate computers. <laughs> it was a challenge. <laughs> I own an AS400. She lived in a house with an AS400. I win. <laughs> My wife can't code. She can't. My daughters can. Because they've learned how, they've practiced, they've done it. My wife's mind doesn't work that way. And she'll admit it, right? This was one of the biggest fights we ever had when we first got married. Because I wanted to be a husband that was involved, and I'm horrible with money. I'm the guy that's like, oh, I've got to pay them to go? <laughs> and my wife says to me, you're good at math. What, you want to help? Let's work together. And Okay, so she would say things to me like, what's 100 plus 200? I made that up. She did not, she never asked me what 100 plus 200 was. Okay, but, and I'd be like, 300. She goes, no, 450. No, that's 300. Well, yeah, there's this other 150 I didn't mention. Well, I need to know that if you want me to add the numbers together, right? Because she just, she was amazing. We were never more than a dime off in our budget because she could just keep it all in her head. She knew where every bill was. She knew whatever, like every every sale we did, every like everything in her head, right? So I bought QuickBooks, uh, Quicken, so that we could uh, work together, right? The first week I got paid, she went into Quick Quicken and did all the numbers. She called me up. She goes, "We're fifteen hundred dollars short this week." I don't make fifteen hundred dollars in a week, right? Like I don't know how the heck. What happened? Turned out, Quicken messed her up. <laughs> it's not how her brain works, right? She can't be a developer, right? But we're promoting it as if everybody can. So this is just a good slide with the icon. I get a kick out of frameworks that are available today. Everybody's a brother. It, it's like, how many people here were Perl developers? Right? The right ones read never language? I don't think everyone's admitting. Yeah, I know, I was gonna say, I mean, you don't wanna admit how old you are, I understand. I was a Perl developer, right? Do you remember that it used to be a rite of passage to create a CPAN module, right? Everybody and their brother wrote their own CPAN module. If you went out to CPAN to search for something, there were four billion modules that would uppercase all the words in a string. Why? Because it was a tutorial somewhere on a Gopher server that people followed. Yes, I said Gopher. Right? Frameworks are the same way now. Everybody and their brother wants to be. There is a framework called Mustache. What does it do? I don't know. I mean, somebody does. I heard somebody over here like. I think it is a templating thing. Yeah, because mustaches look like templates, right? I, don't, I guess. I don't know. It totally makes sense. Yeah, they ran out of names. The next one's going to be called Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. All that. <laughs> so they come up with frameworks like every other day, and then they fork them, and we gotta keep up with them, and we gotta maintain them, and do all this cool stuff with them, right? Why? Because of efficiency. We want the heavy lifting done for us, right? Why is Django a good framework? Because it does lots of things for you, right? Why is Ruby on Rails a good framework for somebody? Because it's psychotic. But, um, sorry, I'm not a Ruby fan. I, I feel like I'm, I'm in a good audience for that. I did a talk at a Ruby conference once. <laughs> they did not like me. <laughs> Ruby's great if you don't really need to maintain the item. <laughs> or run it on a real system. But, we build these frameworks, right? Oh, hey, uh, this will handle 
all of this stuff for us for SQL injection, right? And, and, and Ruby, I think, is a good example of that, right? Um, it moved to the active record system so that you didn't have to worry about SQL injection. If you are testing or developing and, and doing security testing, because you should be, right? A Ruby application, one, I apologize, but two, if you put a single quote in, you won't get a database error message. If you put the tick or one equals one semicolon dash dash, right? Unless it's a MySQL database, then it's semicolon space, hash mark space, but that's a different conversation. It won't error out. It won't dump the database. Why? Because they have put a layer of abstraction that they refer to as active record between the application and the database. And now the developer doesn't have to worry about SQL queries. That's awesome. Until you realize that active record is vulnerable to active record injection. And all I have to do is instead of putting single quote or one equals one semicolon dash dash, I change it to an active record format. So I remember correctly, double quote, bracket, comma, whatever, right? That's all I have to do. And we can dump the database to Ruby on RAM. And when we do that, the developers look at us and go, how did you do that? We're not vulnerable to SQL injection. No, you're right, you're not. <laughs> you're vulnerable to this. We had an application we were testing last year, and uh, we went on site to do the test, because uh, it was a ride-along, which is the type of pen test we do. Um, we, they're called ride-alongs because I watched too many episodes of Cops when I was a kid. <laughs> right? Okay, I'll be honest, when I was an adult too, but that's a different conversation. Uh, right, and we would we ride along as we're doing the pen test. The developers will come sit with us, the security team, the IT admin, whatever. Right, we 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 have them come in, we show them what we're doing, and and this one team came in. They were developers, and they were like, Kevin, you are not going to find any holes in our application. <laughs> really, you, you're willing to say that to me? <laughs> I'm going to have a good day. Because <laughs> here's what I find. The minute a developer competently and truthfully says, truthfully in their mind, you're not going to find any flaws, I know I'm going to find a ton. Because any developer who honestly believes that they have solved every security hole is an idiot. Plain and simple, right? You say to me, hey, Kevin, I think we've made it tough. Okay, now I'm worried, right? You say, hey, we've done a lot to prevent security holes, and I, I, I think you're gonna have a hard time, now I'm worried. The minute you say, we have solved all security problems in our application, I giggle, and I giggle a lot. So I talked to the developer a little bit, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, why, how, did you, how did you do that? Well, you know, big problem we have with SQL injection. SQL injection is awful, da, da, da. And let's be honest, right? SQL injection was discovered and solved 20 plus years ago. The fact that we still use SQL injection as an example is a sad fact. Because we still find it on a regular basis. It's horrible, right? We find it in new apps. I'm cool with it. If you have an app running on your network that's 20 years old and it's vulnerable to SQL injection, stuff happens, right? But the fact that you finished building your app and deployed to production two weeks ago, and I find SQL injection, you should be embarrassed, okay? So the, the developer says to me, we have a framework that solves all of our SQL injection problems. Cool, awesome, okay. So we start testing it. And they were using a framework that I'm not gonna name because I, I, I'm worried that you'd be able to figure out who the customer was, um, because it was pretty, it was like press releases about them using this framework. And so I went out and got a copy of the framework because it's open source. Do you know how they solved SQL injection in the framework? Every time an input came in that had a single quote, they blocked it. They just aired out. Can't use single quotes. You wanna know the really, really cool thing? Like, let's ignore the fact that that's bypassable, right? Like, Blacklisting, oh my God, you're serious? But here's the really cool thing. Every single query the application used, used double quotes for strings instead of single quotes. So they weren't even blocking the character they used on their queries because they didn't understand what the framework was doing. They had been told that the framework would solve the problem. 
and it wasn't. So we dumped the data over and over and over again, right? That was a fun one because at the very end of the test, we went in and we're sitting there with management. They brought the, the CEO of the company in and uh, CEO says to me, Kevin, you're a business owner. Yeah, I am. You're the type of company that would use our services. I am the type of company that would use your services. And the guy said, so would you, after testing our system, would you use our services? And before I could stop myself, I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh damn, I, I, like, I just used myself. And I said, oh God, no. <laughs> No, we would we would not use your services. And the guy's like, why? You'll see it in the report. <laughs> Sorry. So here are some examples, right? And I, and I brought these examples out. I know that they're not all Python. Please deal, right? But I brought these examples out because they cover pretty much the majority of the major flaws we find in applications, right? SQL injection, cross-site request forgery, command injection, cross-site scripting. So Django is actually a fun one. I, I, it was mentioned earlier today. Um, <clears throat> so I was like, kind of excited that it was mentioned because, uh, you know, as of recently as last month, they have found vulnerabilities in Django where the controls built into it didn't cover all the examples. So like, for example, there is a cross-site scripting flaw in Django. Now, I want to be very clear, it doesn't mean that you're vulnerable to it if you use Django. There's you know, different configurations and things like that. But based on the, the framework itself has an anti-cross-site scripting uh, feature. It blocks cross-site scripting attacks, except in certain input types. So on certain input types, the processing of the input follows a different code path and that code path didn't do the cross-site scripting detection and prevention. And so this is exactly the type of flaw I have, right? You use Django, you build your application, you, and, and let me be blunt, I think it's a good idea that if something is handling the protection, don't reproduce the wheel, right? There, there, you shouldn't rewrite the code, but you should verify it's doing what you think it's doing. And I'll give you a good reason not to, bear, to reproduce the code. I have another customer that actually happens to be running Django, right? And they get input from users and the back end application that is running Django uh, blocks cross-site scripting. And it logs when it gets an input that it considers cross-site scripting, right? And one of the characters it logs that it alerts on is an asterisk. I don't know why they decided an asterisk was a bad character, but they did, okay? I, I lean toward believing it's an LDAP or SQL injection uh, protection that happens to be being called XSS, but we don't need to go into that right now. Right, so, but the developers felt they needed to reproduce that protection on the front end app. So what they do in the front end app is if they get any characters they believe are cross site scripting, they convert them to asterisks, and then they submit them to the, the backend system. And the reasoning is they're defanging the attack. And you know what? It's actually not a bad idea, right? If you've got an input that you have to accept, that it's not acceptable from a business perspective to reject that input, right? Changing the characters to something that you believe would defang the attack is a good plan. The problem is they change the character to a character the backend system considers bad. So they are literally taking inputs that are not attacks and then converting them to a format that the backend system rejects, right? And then they're alerting, they're logging, they're, they're, every day they run through. That's why you don't reinvent the wheel. But we've got Django, where it's got that. Django in uh, the end of 2016, 2016 had a hard-coded password. When you installed it, when it built itself up, it created an account in the backend database that had a known password. So if I, as an attacker, get access to that database, I know the password belongs. The framework just really weakened your security. Now, I hope that backend database is not accessible 
to me. I would hope that you've segmented it well enough that I can't get to it. My hope would probably be wrong, right? Especially now that we're talking cloud-based, right? Everybody and their brother, hey, let's move to Amazon. Expose our database to the entire world. It's a good plan. I like it. You guys know the rule, right? When a pen tester likes something, you get it the heck off your network. I love SharePoint. But we also see things. I talked about struts, right? A deserialization flaw. How many people here are familiar with deserialization? Right? Yeah, serialization is when you take a, a, an object or something and you serialize it. Typically, you're converting it into text so that it can be handled back and forth, right? The deserialization problem is that data has to be deserialized, right? It has to be taken back from that text format and put back into an object or some other format that may have. And how, what happens at that point? The struts deserialization problem is a Java issue to most people. It's actually why I bring it up. It's actually what hit Equifax. Equifax was hit with the deserialization issue that caused command execution. Because what you could do is in that object, before it was serialized, you could put Java code into the object. Then, when that, it was serialized, it was converted into a text string, pushed into the application, blah, 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 then it would deserialize it to handle it. The blah, blah, blah was moving through the application. It's what the network sound makes. Uh, listen closely, you'll hear. Maybe. <laughs> when it's deserialized, the Java executor would see that Java code and treat it as code in the application. And it would run it. And so we could inject the objects in Java to execute system commands. And what did we run as? Almost always root. Or something close to root, right? The wSphere user. The problem is the wSphere user has full pseudo rights without a password to run any command they want, right? So on root, I just don't have the name. Right? Now here's the fun part about deserialization flaws. They're not a Java problem. They are an every language problem. If your language uses serialization, there is a dang good chance it has a serialization flaw. We have found them in Python. We have found them in PHP. We have found them in JavaScript. We have found them in Ruby. The problem, though, is that everybody talks about it as a Java issue. And your frameworks, in many cases, will serialize data without you knowing it, right? The framework itself, Struts is a great example of this. I don't care how well you wrote your application, Struts was vulnerable. I don't care how much you paid attention to security, Struts was the issue. That's the example with all of these. This one is actually one of my favorite ones, jQuery. How many people here use jQuery, right? Client-side library, JavaScript, real big on front-end systems, has had more vulnerabilities than PHP. Okay, maybe not. PHP is the language you beat up on, right? I feel like Microsoft should buy PHP just so we have one organization to make fun of. <laughs> but... <laughs> jQuery has tons of flaws, right? They've had cross-site scripting flaws. They've had injection flaws. They've had um, tons of issues where you can uh, do arbitrary code. They have a, a library called jQuery Migrate. Is it Migrate? J it's jQuery Migrate, sorry. Every one of their libraries is jQuery something. But jQuery Migrate is designed because they, like other developers, other frameworks, when they have a new major version, the API is different, right? And they'll actually change the jQuery library to a point where you have to rewrite your code to call it correctly. And so what they have is this migrate library, and the migrate library is something that you can inject, uh, not a bad injection. I realize having a pen tester say inject has a certain term to it, right? Um, you can use this jQuery library, migrate library to be able to not worry about rewriting all of your code right away. Okay, and so you can use it as a transition period. We actually see uh, some people have transition periods of up to like two years. It's awesome. But um, the problem is that the jQuery migrate library actually reintroduces the vulnerabilities. So like if you have 
jQuery 1.5, let's make up a number, right? And it had a cross-site scripting flaw, and so you upgraded to jQuery 1.6. Again, made up the number, right? But to do that migration, you added the jQuery migrate. So the 1.6 version isn't vulnerable to cross-site scripting, but the migrate library puts it back in. So if you look at the library version, it's like, oh, I'm at 1.6, I'm not vulnerable anymore. But because you're using migrate, you are. And it makes sense if you think about it, right? The cross-site script problem in 1.5, again, made up number, don't go cold, like, oh, Kevin said 1.5. Uh, that version was vulnerable to cross-site scripting because of the way they were handling input. The way they handle input is done by the migrate library, which means the migrate library has the vulnerability. Plain and simple. So the question up here is, how do I work on uh, working upstream in the development process, leadership, product idea, design, marketing, to help inject security in the business mindset? That is an awesome question, because it ties directly to all of this, right? Because the problem here is we don't have security in the mindset of when we start. And my answer is, Stop saying you need to inject security higher up in the system. Stop talking about it that way. Start talking about security as a feature and function of code, of application, of business. I'm going to say something that you all are going to be like, no, that dude's on drugs. The PCI Council got something right last year. <laughs> you know PCI, right? It must be this tall to ride the internet. They got something right last year when they released PCI 3. They said, because we all know it, right? Yeah, how many people here are under PCI at some point or another, right? Your application, like, totally, like PCI sucks. Oh man, you have to do vulnerability scanning all the time. Notice it doesn't say you have to fix the vulnerabilities found. You just have to scan for them. Wow, we're uh, vulnerable. Okay, compliant. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> How many people here have worked in an organization where you get the phone call? Dude, dude, you doing a pen test next week? Fix your shit. <laughs> right? We just had a customer have us do a pen test, right? In Canada, in negative 10. I didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> so they say to us, before you pen test, Monday morning, what we want you to do, we want you to break into the building, find a conference room, and then start hacking. Okay, we do that, right? Like, we do physical tests. I have a FedEx uniform. Bought on eBay, 40 bucks. UPS delivered it. <laughs> <laughs> I giggled, right? <laughs> the best part was, I get lots of FedEx and UPS deliveries because I'm addicted to Amazon Prime. And um, so when I got the box, I knew what it was, and I started to laugh. And the UPS guy, who knows me, because he's constantly, it's so bad that he has actually been at a restaurant and seen my family and walked up and said, hey, how you guys doing? Like, that's creepy, okay? But, so when I started laughing, like, what's so funny, what'd you get? I'm like, oh, dude, it's awesome, look. And I opened the box and he looked at me, and he gets this look on his face and he goes, they use us to deliver? <laughs> yes, but. <laughs> so my, my two people, Kate and Eric, went up there. Kate was oh man, awesome pen testers, right? And, and she and he go up there, and uh, they walk up to the building Monday morning, right? It's cold, negative 10, and there is literally a poster on the door that says, don't forget security awareness, don't let people piggyback, don't let... They ran their awareness training the Friday before the test. Yeah, that was real, right? But PCI realized that people are doing this. People realize, hey, when you do that annual PCI pen test, right, fix all your stuff the weekend before, and then you're good, right? They realized that. So what they said was, security has to be business. See, yeah, the tangent, it actually was related. But <laughs> nobody thinks it's related. They said, security has to be business as usual. You can't be doing a point in time of security. You have to be doing security all the time. Security has to be part of your business. And that's how you inject it, is you stop talking about it as something separate. You start talking about security as just a function of the business. Now, that doesn't solve the problem entirely, right? You also have to show them a return. You have to show them why it's important, even with these frameworks, for you to build the application securely. And that's becoming easier and easier. And the reason it's becoming easier and easier 
is because we're seeing more and more news about people getting hacked. We're getting more data about the fact that it costs Target $250 million to deal with their breach, right? I think that was the number that was quoted. I may have that one slightly off, right? Equifax is dealing with this now, right? Lots of companies, more and more, we see organizations dealing with this, and so it should be easier. And here's where you want to like start working. Go to your procurement and your project management offices, if you have them. If you don't, go deal with the people who do the buying and project management for your organization and get them to understand why security is important. Additive milestones, make it part of what you're dealing with and have them understand what's important about it. And that will help move that upstream. Does that make sense? So I've got like a minute or some 30 seconds. Any final questions to throw at me, ask, or anything else? Well, that was easy. I'd like to say thank you very much for coming. I'm going to be hanging out for a while. If you have any questions about the nerd hacker guy, uh, we'll be here. Um, and if not, you're always welcome to drop me an email, uh, call me or whatever, because I mean it when I say our job is to answer questions. Our job is to help people get better and have more information. Okay? Thank you very much, everybody. Awesome. Thank you very much, Kevin.